One uh, scripture, of course, is Matthew chapter 12. We're continuing to work on um, verse uh, 40, and we're attaching 41 to it as we uh, move into this. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 and 41 particularly. But uh, also, I'd like for you to look up uh, the passage uh, found in Jonah, the book of Jonah. And uh, it's close to the end of the Old Testament. Uh, it's one of the minor prophets. There are only four chapters in it. You can read the thing in just a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, if we weren't so short on time, I would read it. But I want to walk you through the first chapter of Jonah and uh, kind of tie it in with, this, uh, with what Jesus is saying. So as you move into Matthew chapter 12, uh, you know that, of course, he's in this constant conflict on this Sabbath day uh, with the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel uh, and the scribes, and it's all over uh, the Sabbath day laws, and they're having quite a uh, debate about this whole thing. Uh, Jesus is doing all kinds of miracles on the Sabbath day. They get so frustrated with him that they say he's in league and doing with the devil and doing all this thing by the power of the devil. And Jesus really launches into a discourse to try to explain to them that uh, your life is one big mouth. Um, lots of people have said that to me, of course, but uh, your life is just one big mouth, and it's always speaking, and what is speaking is your nature. It speaks out of your nature. So your mouth is an expression of your nature. Uh, you don't express other people's feelings, you express your own. So your mouth expresses what words that come out of you express what you're feeling, what's going on in you, how you view it, what, what's taking place in your life, so your life is one big mouth giving expression. And he says your life is giving expression to your nature. And it isn't that your mouth has to search for things to find, search for things and to find things to say because your heart is full of abundance and all over the place. And your, just mouth, your mouth just opens up and pff, out it comes. So he says that's your life. And they by that time have gone off and uh, some of the rest of them who've been hanging around try to take a different approach now to get at Jesus. And they come to him in verse 38 and say, we want to see a sign. So the statement at the end of verse 38, if you'll read with me, is, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered and said to them, an adulterous, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he continues. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this, with this, this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here been a while since I dealt with the story of Jonah, and you may have read it just yesterday, I don't know, but uh, if you're like I am, you, well, you wouldn't be like I am, because I learned jo the story of Jonah on flannel graph. And uh, the details of, the, of uh, Jonah and that whole story are, are really interesting, and I'd forgotten most of them, so I went back and reviewed this whole thing. So I'd like for you to turn back to the book of Jonah and look with me at uh, Jonah chapter 1. And the details are really kind of interesting about what his situation was and what God was doing in his life. And it starts out in verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. So God initiated this whole thing right off the bat. I mean, the first opening words of his story is, God's moved upon the life of Jonah. And of course, that would have to be your testimony as well. Because God has moved upon your life. God has initiated. See, you didn't come to him, he came to you. You didn't look, at, you didn't look for him, he looked for you. See, you ran from him, he chased you down. See, the whole gospel story is that God has come your way and in the word of the Lord has come to you. Uh, so if you know anything about goodness at all, it's, become, it's been because God has moved upon you. It's not because you're so bright. No amens on that. So uh, God initiated this whole thing. And uh, God, of course, uh, shows his heart in all of this. And he calls Jonah uh, to be a part of his heart. And what is the heart of God? He says, verse 2, Arise, here's the word that came to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. 
So he says, Jonah, I want you to get down there to the Ninevites and I want you to preach to them and I want you to tell them about me because they're in wickedness and their lives are being destroyed and I just can't stand it. Now that's really interesting in an Old Testament setting because you understand the Ninevites are not Israelites. They're pagans. They're Gentiles. They're, hey, they're not a part of the chosen people of God. They're not, they don't, they're not one of the tribes of Israel. Come on. Hey, God is focused on this little group right here, the Jews, and Jonah would be a part of that group. And Jonah is saying, God, you want me to go down to those nasty, mean, awful people that aren't even like us? Oh, they have all kinds of things about them that are just weird and turn me off and I don't like them. They're not like we are. They don't eat the food we eat. They, aren't just, they don't look like us. They're just not our kind. And I don't want to go down there. But God has called them down there. See, the heart of God is for everybody. And there's quite a message in that, folks. That the heart of God, even in the Old Testament, is for everybody. The heart of God, did you get it, is for everybody. He's not selected a few and said, oh, I want them, but the rest of you can go your way. The heart of God is for everybody, even the Ninevites. So the word of the Lord has come to Jonah and said, hey, go down there. I care about these people. But, verse 3, but, contrast. So over here is the word of the Lord has come to Jonah, and here's the heart of God. But Jonah... He has another heart. He doesn't have the heart of God. So in verse 3, it says, Jonah rose to flee to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Now, that's a stupid thing, isn't it? Jonah thinks he's going to get on a ship and go to Tarsus and leave the presence of the Lord as if the presence of the Lord was located in this building. See, I just won't show up here. And then God won't. What are you talking about? He's in your bedroom. <laughs> Well, I'll watch TV. He'll leap off the, uh, the front of the TV and get you. Well, I'll go down to the local bar. Whoops, he's sitting down there too. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide, son. See, that's the story. So he thinks he's going to get away from the presence of God. So the contrast is, over here's God and his heart. Jonah, I want you to really go down there and talk to the people because I really care about them. Over here is Jonah says, hey, I don't want to do that, and I'm, I'm not going to. And so he goes in the opposite direction in an attempt to run from the, heart, from the presence of God. So he went down in verse, five, you'll, or verse uh, 3, you'll note. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare. Now that's an interesting statement. Because it was really costly. Paid the fare. Yeah, he's going to have to pay. Jonah, you're going to pay for this. Hey, you're running from God. You're going to pay for this. You can count on it. And the cost will really be high. Really be high. So he's running from God. He's paid the fare. He went down into it which is another whole sermon, because he went down, which is the only way to go when you're running for the presence of God, is down. <laughs> it's the best you can do, folks, is go down. <laughs> you can't go up. <laughs> oh, just this is a great story, isn't it? So he goes down into it to go with them to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Now, but, then look at verse 4, but, got a contrast again. So Jonah's got it all under control. He's paid the fare. He's got it all down. He's going down in the bottom of the ship now. And But God sent a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. And the sailors were afraid, and every man cried out to his God. So God has caused this storm, and this storm is so fierce that all the sailors are scared to death, so they're crying out to their many gods, whatever god they have. They're crying out saying, hey, get us out of this. Now, these are experienced sailors, you know, and nothing scares them. They've seen it all, been there, done that, and so forth. But this storm scared them to the point of prayer, which means it's really severe, so things are really going down hard. So they begin to throw over the cargo, which would really be significant because, hey, that's our livelihood. But hey, we'd rather lose the cargo than lose our lives. So they're, sp they're putting the cargo over the side that was in the ship to lighten the load. But, get this, Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down and was fast asleep. <laughs> See, sin lulls you to sleep. Lulls you to sleep. And, and it's really interesting, as he's lulled to sleep by sin, thinking it's all settled, got it all done, made up his mind, hey, it's over. 
when he's lawed himself to sleep, in verse 6, the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? <laughs> Call him out, man. I felt like doing that in some services, of course. <laughs> never mind, never mind. What do you mean, sleeper? <laughs> Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, hey, we don't know what the problem is here, why this is all happening to us, but hey, let's do this. And in verse 7, let us cast lots. That's throw dice. Uh, I explained to the students in terms of the, sh the straw thing, you know, you get all these linked to straw. Hey, short straw gets it, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's casting lots, throwing the dice, whatever. So cast the lots that we may know for what cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots. Oh, brother, the lot fell on Jonah. <laughs> Poor guy can't get a break, can he? Poor fella. The cost is high. And they said to him, please tell us, Jonah, for what cause is this trouble come upon us? What is your occupation? Oh, I hate it when they ask me that. Especially when I've been stopped by the police. <laughs> what is your occupation? What do you come from? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm? For the sea is growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, and I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. Didn't want to do that. They rode hard to the land, but they could not. They couldn't make it. For the sea continued to grow. And therefore, they cried out to the Lord, saying, We pray, O Lord, Please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done, it, done, it, done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its rage, raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days. And three nights. That's the story. Now, all these hundreds of years later, Jesus comes along, and they're demanding a sign. We want a sign. And he said, hey, boys, we're down to one thing. I'm only giving you one sign, and only one, and that is, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, in the belly of the great fish. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, some Bible scholars say this is a type. In other words, Jonah is a type of the Christ. What is a type? A type is a symbol. A type is like a sacrifice lamb. They offered a sacrifice lamb, which was a symbol of the lamb that was going to come. And the shedding of the lamb would take place and then there would be no more sacrifice lambs because the lamb was a type of the coming Christ. Others Bible scholars say absolutely not. This is not a type because it doesn't fulfill and you can study all that on your own. And I say all that basically for the students. But when you come, if you say it isn't a type, okay, no problem. If you say it is a type, no problem. It all ends up to be the same because there is a comparison going on. Over here on this side is a Jonah who's in the belly of a great fish three days and three nights. Over here is Jesus who is in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And he says, as so. Now the words as so means in the exact same manner. Now note, he doesn't say a thing about the, cruci he doesn't say a thing about the resurrection. No mention of the resurrection in this at all. That will come, of course, as he gets more into the predictions of his death and resurrection. But in this particular passage, he's not giving in. The sign doesn't have anything to do with the resurrection as it has exclusively to do with the cross event itself, his death and three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he parallels it to Jonah 
three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. Now, there's some interesting contrast, and there's three of these, and obviously won't, we won't do them all, but the first one is sin. Now, I know we've hounded this. I know we've said this a lot. And to tell you the truth, we're going to keep saying it because I don't, I think you forget. I think the tendency is to forget it. Ladies and gentlemen, the fundamental trick, listen to this, the fundamental trick of the devil is to get you to see sin as a deed or activity. And you define sin as a deed or activity. Now, what happens when you do that is, if you see sin and define sin as, oh, that's a sin. Why is it a sin? Because he did that. Then you define it as a deed, an activity that somebody does, a movement that somebody makes, an involvement that somebody has, a deed that they do, that becomes the sin. Then you can easily make a list and say, oh, these deeds are sins, these deeds are not. So if I don't do these things and I do these things, whoa, I've got it made. When the truth of the matter is you could not do any of these things and you could do all of these things and still be the worst sinner that ever lived. Because sin cannot be defined as an activity or deed that you do. The deed of sin is a symptom an extension a product of the core, the deed of sin is a product, a symptom, symptom of, a, of a core issue, which is really sin itself. And the deed is not the sin. It's the core issue. It's the heart. It's the nature. It's the attitude. And it's the attitude, the essence of sin, that makes this particular deed end up being a sin. But if you did that deed without this core issue, then it wouldn't be a sin. Oh, your brows are wrinkled. It's hard to think, isn't it? And my favorite illustration, which I've given you a dozen times, is God comes to my life and says, Manly, I want you to clean out toilets for the rest of your life. And I say, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to clean out toilets. Just not going to do it. Well, what are you going to do with your life, mainly? I'm going to preach. Then preaching would be a sin. Well, preaching isn't a sin. Well, it could be. Well, is it or isn't it? It's not about the deed, folks. It's about the attitude that produces the deed. Come on, that's not hard. That's exactly what's going down in the scriptures. You see it everywhere. Adam and Eve come along. And what do they do? Oh, they picked that fruit. That's what they did. It. Hey, they did a sin picking a fruit. Well, picking fruit is not sinful, folks. Because lots of people pick lots of fruits and it's not a sin. See, sin is not about picking a fruit. Well, it was for them. It wasn't about the deed. They had already given themselves to a desire. They had already given, they had sinned before they, if they'd never picked the deed, they'd, if they'd never picked the apple, they would, if they ever did that deed, they would still have been into sin because sin was, they gave into an inward desire and attitude. And that was the sin, not the deed. The deed was an expression of the inward attitude. Now, Jonah, you see that. God is called, the call of God has come in verse 1. God came to Jonah and said, Jonah, here's my heart, man. Here's what I want you involved with. Would you help me on this? Would you go down there to Nineveh? Would you be my mouthpiece? Would you speak for me? What a privilege that is. And then God gave him instructions in verse 2 after the call and gave him detailed instructions of exactly where he wanted him to go and when he wanted him to go there. And what did Jonah say? No. I'm not going to do that. And an inward attitude took place in Jonah. 
It wasn't the fact that he didn't go to Nineveh that was the sin. It was the fact of the attitude that he was rebelling. I want to do my thing. I want to live my way. I want to have my... I, no, I'm not, go, I'm not interested in... Lord, I've got my plans. I want... I've got... And that produced... Go to Tarsus. Wasn't going to Tarsus. Lots of people went to Tarsus and didn't sin. Well, he got on a ship. Lots of people get on ships. Get on ships and that's not a sin. Well, he was asleep in the bottom of the boat. Well, lots of people sleep, and it's not sinful. See, what's the sin here? It isn't about the deed. It isn't about Tarsus. It isn't, about, it's a, it isn't even about Nineveh. It's about this core issue in the heart of Jonah that says, I'm going to do my own thing. And every time that shows up it's sin and that's what God wants to take care of in my life this is oh you got to see this this is not a God who's hanging around slapping my hands saying don't do that I'm watching you See, that, folks, that's not what we've got going on. What we've got going on is we've got a God who wants to come to the core of my life and say, hey, could you and I get together? Could you and I fall in love? Could I be your bridegroom and you be my bride? Could we literally embrace together? Could we literally become one? Could you become a part of what I'm all about? Listen, I've got dreams. Would you like to become a part of my dream? And would you come and give your life to me and let us get involved together until my will begins to flow through you? Would you be willing to open yourself to that? he says that's what he wants so sin cannot be defined in terms of the accomplishment or the doing of a deed or the activity it's always about the core inside essence nature now in our passage that's compared to Jesus Jesus didn't sin. I know. He never did a deed of sin. Okay. But you know why he never did a deed of sin? Because he never had the core of sin. See, he never had the attitude of sin. There was never a time in the life, isn't that phenomenal? Never a time in the life of Jesus where he, see, the father comes to Jesus and what does he do? Open. Do you mean Jesus never made a mistake? Didn't say that. In fact, we've talked about it around here. I think Jesus made all kinds of mistakes. Why? Human beings make mistakes. And I know some of you are saying prove that. And, of course, we've given you examples like Jesus wasn't born potty trained but messed his pants as a baby, which would be a mistake to your mother. but not sin. So what we're talking about is a core attitude, and Jesus never had that core attitude. Isn't that phenomenal? Never had that core attitude. And yet the interesting thing is that the attitude of rebelling against God that expressed itself in the deed of sin ended up putting Jonah in the belly of a great fish. That's true. Jesus never had an attitude against God and yet that put him in the heart of the earth which is paralleled to Jonah. Think that through. How could that be? How did that go down? Because Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days. Are you thinking? For three days and three nights because he had a bad attitude towards God. His sin. Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights because he had the attitude of God. Let me state it another way. Jonah 
was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights because he had an attitude against God. Jesus was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights because he had an attitude of God. And he was there. This is the gospel message, folks. He was there because he took all the result of your deed and attitude of sin and experienced the results of it. And as Jonah experienced the results of sin, Jesus experienced the results of sin. Only Jonah experienced the result of his own sin. Jesus experienced the result of my sin. That's the sign. That's the sign. Jesus is saying, this is how God feels. How does God feel? What kind of an attitude does God have? Oh, he has an attitude of, I'll go to the heart of the earth for you he's not against you he hasn't come to slap your hand he's come to take it for you don't fight against that he hasn't come to pat you on the head say oh it's okay he's come to do radical change at the core essence, attitude of your heart. He hasn't come to correct your deeds only. He's come to correct the attitude that caused your deeds, which will radically transform your life. Who wouldn't want that? Jesus. We're guilty. I'm guilty. I've ran from you. Found myself in the bottom of a boat asleep. Asleep. but I couldn't escape your presence. You wouldn't leave me there asleep, would you? Brought a storm, sent the captain, woke me up. Even the dice got me. Everywhere I turned, you were in my face. And here we are again tonight. Your heart has come again. Because what you're interested in, you're not against me. But you see where the attitude is going to take me. You see where my self-living is going to send me. You see the awfulness of what it's going to do to me. It'll put me in the belly of a great fish. It'll bring me damnation. You see the attitude, God. And Lord, what we're fighting tonight, we're not fighting against changing just actions. We're not fighting against just doing better things. What we're really up against is, oh, my heart, my life is one big mouth. It speaks out of my nature. Would you change my nature? I can't do that. You can. You went to the heart of the earth and took the total penalty for my nature. So 
So I'm not running anymore, God. I'm planting myself in your face. Saying, Jesus, what are you going to do with me? Here I am. So call us tonight to that which is beyond ourselves. Heads are bowed. Don't run. Don't run into religious things. Don't run into sinful things. Don't run into the world. Don't run into the church. Don't camouflage with drugs, alcohol, whatever. Don't camouflage with prayer, singing, worship, preaching. Come to grips with nature. He wants to do something deep. He's calling you to be a part of his heart. Oh, his heart. Oh, his heart. Would you embrace his heart tonight? And let his heart do in you what he wants to do. Moments of seeking. Let him change you from within. Be obedient.